Good morning and welcome to part two of the funding webinar series. Today we have our private funders with us and we have uh, Cynthia Liston with the John Belk Endowment, she's a program officer. We have Jason Baisden with Kate B. Reynolds Charitable, Charitable Trust, um, who's also a program officer. And we have Kristen Frick Richardson with the Duke Endowment. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Debbie Warren as our moderator and our panel. Welcome, Jason. So Jason, uh, right, right. Uh, as, as working for KP Reynolds, is now the Western Program Officer, but he was formerly the Eastern Program Officer, so ready folks, he knows the East and the West. <laughs> <laughs> you need to know both. Thanks for having me here. It's uh, great to be here um, and participate in this. So we'll get started here. I want to try to leave some time for some questions and kind of go through that, uh, but I'll just start with, um, let's make sure. Okay. Well, let's see. Well, <laughs> as we do some of the technology here, uh, I can go over some of this uh, as well. Um, as many of you may already know, we are uh, largely a healthcare funder. We do some stuff specifically in uh, Forsyth County that's a little bit different, but. Um, largely, we do. Uh, oh, there, there we go. Uh, largely, uh, healthcare funder for 100 counties here in North Carolina. Okay, we've got this going here. So great. Uh, all 100 counties in North Carolina. Um, as you can see, our mission is to improve the quality of life and quality of health for financially needy in North Carolina. Um, I'll kind of breeze through some of this so that we can get to some of the questions, but largely in probably about seven to ten years ago, we started to make a shift at the trust. So we, we're going on 70 years um, in, you know, of being a foundation. And about seven to ten years ago, we started to look um, and say, how many funders are out there specifically doing things in rural North Carolina? And yes, there's funders doing that, but their specific focus, rural, uh, we didn't see too many, so we kind of said, uh, that we would take that take that on. So we kind of shifted um, into being more focused, looking at uh, active philanthropy, kind of learning from the community as we are out there, um, but with a shift to largely being a uh, rural funder. You'll see that some of the types of grants that we do are similar to other uh, foundations, but largely operating program grants. But uh, we do do some capital project grants as, as well. Uh, right now, that's largely in our healthy places, uh, North Carolina counties, and we'll be getting into that uh, a little bit here um, later. But with the switch to, to rural focus, um, kind of changing a little bit uh, how we looked at philanthropy and how we looked at grant making, and, and specifically. Um, in the past, it had been some of the more traditional type of organizations, you know, hospitals and, and uh, fairly qualified health centers and doctors, nurses, those types of grants, and, and we still do those. But we also wanted to see, um, you know, how, how can we potentially move the needle further? And so we launched uh, uh, several initiatives, one being the rural focus, and we'll get into some of these others as well. We do capacity building grants. Uh, we do direct service. Uh, we have some technical assistance and program planning, as you can see. A lot of this is on our website, too, so if, um, if I'm going too fast, you can, you can always reference that as well. We put out a funding announcement each May and each November, um, and, and it'll have a lot of this information in it as well. Uh, a lot of the capacity building work is trying to to help organizations increase their capacity, uh, leadership training and things of that nature um, that we're doing and some, some work that's really tailored to the Healthy Places counties as well in, in that realm. Um, things that we typically don't fund um, are general organizational expenses, um, although we, we have done some general operating support, but, but largely don't do that. Um, Community health assessments, medical research, uh, 
uh, accreditation, things of that nature. Um, but but operating grants and capital grants, um, if it's within our funding areas, then we'll certainly take a look at it. We'll get into that as well. As far as our application process, um, the step one is we have the funding announcement that I mentioned. Uh, and we do something uh, maybe a little bit different than, than some foundations, although I think some do this as well. Um, the, after the funding announcement, uh, folks are encouraged to call in. Uh, the main contact is Erin Barlow, who's our program coordinator, and, and she kind of fields all the phone calls first and helps direct. Some things don't quite fit and she'll kind of let those folks know, hey, there might be a different resource out there for you. We're, we're not quite the fit for you. Um, that project idea is not quite a fit for our funding interests. Um, but if it is, then she will schedule an advanced consultation with one of the program officers. So we have three program officers, one in Eastern North Carolina, one in Central North Carolina, and I am the program officer in Western North Carolina. So uh, if you are in this process or maybe you've gone through it before, um, it's a sit down, it's usually 45 minutes to an hour. We discuss, it's very informal. Um, we discuss your project idea, and usually at the end of that consultation, we try to give you some direction, either encourage you to apply. Sometimes we will just discourage, uh, and there's some reasons that uh, we might do that. Certainly not being quite a fit would be one, but there's some other things as well. But if you're encouraged to apply, then the application um, is online and you fill that application out online. And then the review process takes uh, anywhere from six to eight weeks and funding announcements follow shortly thereafter. The review and notification process uh, says 90 to 120 days. Sometimes it just depends on how many um, grants we have reviewed. Uh, but we give everyone a personal phone call, whether you um, were awarded or not, and kind of talk talk you through that. Um, and as you can see, some of the criteria, whether it's in our funding interest, what kind of depth and scope of the project, and, and whether the organization has the capacity to actually do, do what they're proposing, some of the main things that we're looking at. And priority is given to Tier 1 counties, uh, involved count, uh, community-based collaborations and demonstrate integration of care or some of the other ones as well. And the funding decisions are ultimately made by our trustee, Wells Fargo. That was something I didn't realize when I was on the nonprofit side, that uh, the trust is actually governed by Wells Fargo. It used to be Wachovia. Um, so we're a little bit different in that um, regard to some other foundations that have larger boards. These, these folks are actually Wells, uh, Wells Fargo employees. Um, I mentioned and referenced Healthy Places North Carolina several times. This is what the initiative is. It's a community-based initiative to invest $100 million over the next 10 years to improve the health in 10 to 12 counties, rural counties. Uh, we are in Beaufort County, Nash and Edgecombe, Halifax, Rockingham, Burke, and McDowell currently. And we're likely to launch one to two new counties um, probably in eastern North Carolina in 2017. And this is really where I wanted to spend just a little bit of time uh, when I was talking about the, the shift in strategy from um, what had been the traditional approach and now with a rural focus, this focuses it in uh, even more so. Uh, Healthy Places is a place-based philanthropic strategy model, however you want to, um, to term that, uh, but a little bit different than some that you might have seen nationally. Um, typically, uh, what we have seen in some of the research is, you know, a funder will come in and say, hey, here are your challenges, and here are your solutions. 
uh, and that doesn't always work if you're in a rural community. You might have experienced something like that, and after the funder left the room, you kind of go, oh, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know, Beaufort County, uh, that won't work here. Um, but, you know, you're presented with the square peg in the round hole, so you and the community go, how can we make this square peg go into this round hole? And largely, it's not as effective as it could be. So this strategy is really about going into the community, working with folks in the community, listening. What are your issues? What are your challenges? Okay. Uh, in some of these rural communities, uh, you'll see a theme. Uh, those themes can be things like transportation. I'm, I don't think there's a rural community that I've been in yet where transportation wasn't an issue. But what are your issues? What are your challenges? And then what do you think are the solutions? or partial solutions or building blocks for future uh, larger scale systems change type of solutions. And then we look at where we can fit in based upon uh, our funding interests, uh, as well as look at, you know, is there capacity building work that needs to take place here? Um, for instance, we bring in uh, Center for Creative Leadership into all of these counties and so folks that might not ever be able to access that kind of training. We do it in county, in the county. Um, and then bring other resources. We, we have good relationships with funders here in North Carolina and, and nationally and, and federal programs. What makes sense for, for what your uh, situation is and what your challenge and solution is. We try to bring those resources there as well. Um, and so kind of to what we were thinking successful looked like initially is, you know, re-energized efforts, um, gaps in service being identified, and, you know, new partners. I think one of the key things is um, it's beyond, the, the work we're doing is beyond kind of the traditional partners. Um, we're trying to bring in folks that might not even think that they are uh, involved in healthcare, I, and I, I typically talk about the faith community as, you know, you talk to a pastor or minister, uh, and they might say, well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm responsible for the spiritual health of folks in my community, but how am I? Well, we're seeing a lot more movement in that area of, hey, there's there's physical health as well, and, 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 and you're a leader um, in this. Please come along and, and, and offer your voice as well. Uh, what would it look like in a few years? Uh, creating new approaches. I think you know we're really looking for innovation, countywide thinking, not just silo kind of projects, um, but integrated things that build on one another uh, and that are are not again not siloed. I think we uh, certainly at the trust might have unintentionally done that in the past by you know, funding a diabetes project over here and doing another one in the county over here and not really linking them together. So we're, we're trying to, to move away from that and towards more integrated kind of uh, grant making. And what will it look like later? Uh, one or two major multi-system efforts aligned in making major progress in improving the outcomes on several indicators. That the, the community chooses. So I'll stop there. I, I don't know if I'm quite at my time, but um, I you can. No, you're exactly at your time. It's perfect. Okay, okay great. So, so, so several questions first about healthy places. So um, you've been in it for, I guess, three or four years so far? Correct. And what would be an example of something that you funded that, that the foundation really feels is on the right track? A grant. What does a grant look like? Who gets them? And is it? Well, uh, they in Healthy Places County, there's some folks that wouldn't traditionally see uh, our healthcare division. So we've done work um, with the school system. Um, we've done some work in our community center prevention uh, along the lines of kind of healthy eating, active living that wouldn't look like a traditional grant in the past. So school systems building playgrounds. You know, at first kind of. What does a playground have to do with healthcare? But interweaving that in, um, some larger kind of projects have involved folks like, you know, uh, thinking of one in Beaufort County where the hospital um, is really looking at behavioral health and 
you know, ER diversion kind of things, but working in concert with the federally qualified health center in the community and also working in concert with uh, Access East, which is the, the CCNC organization for 20-something counties in eastern North Carolina. Um, uh, three separate grants, but they're all interconnected, so they, they have behavioral health as a theme or access to care as a, a uniting theme. Um, one of it, one specific part is dealing with the pharmaceutical aspect, med reconciliation on behavioral health and things. Others looking at primary care access coupled with behavioral health. And then one aspect of the program is uh, just the uninsured aspect of everything. So um, that would be kind of one example, but there's there's lots that are coming yeah, out of yeah. healthy places. And, and how will the foundation make a decision on which counties in eastern North Carolina to go in next year? Typically, how do you do that? They, they had kind of mapped out uh, a number of counties when they first started in 2012. And so those counties um, um, are still being considered. And typically what happens is a program officer will go and spend some time in those communities to kind of really see what is going on. Um, and you know, can there be something built upon that? So um, they've got to be a tier one county. That's that's a, a given. But um, but other than that, when people ask me, uh, the easiest way to kind of describe it is: is there a spark in the community that um, that together with the trust and others can kind of flame, you know, fan that into a flame um, and spur on even bigger thinking and even bigger results. And, and what about um, the non-Healthy Places funding? When we're talking about rural North Carolina, for example, how many dollars in grants are given out a year approximately? How big is that? 20 to 25 million. Um, in, in the health in, portfolio. And in, in, uh, for the whole year, about half of that is designated for uh, Healthy Places counties. So, um, so 10 to 12 million or so for other grant making. And that's typically within the diabetes uh, funding interest or the access to care funding interest, mental health, substance abuse fund, funding interest, or community center prevention. Those are our four main funding interests. And, and what's a particular grant that you, you're fond of that you really think um, is represents what the foundation is trying to do, not in the healthy places, but in the general portfolio? If that exemplifies the kind of work that you do. Well, I, I think, you know, anything that is kind of trying to stretch the bounds a little bit beyond kind of the traditional approaches, um, we're certainly interested in. Um, I think, you know, we, we became interested early on with the community paramedicine programs. Um, and uh, so I think uh, in Lumberton, uh, Southeastern Region, Regional Medical Center, um, com community paramedicine program, which was a little a little bit of a tweak on some of the ones that are already developed where um, these folks were looking to not only go at the, the easiest way is community paramedicine phone call EMS maybe law enforcement arrives their approach is let's see if we can get the 911 call from never happening never, never occurring and bringing kind of telepsych <laughs> equipment out on site it's telepsych yeah tell us tell us uh, uh, tell us psych equipment, you know, with the EMS. Mm -hmm. um, so it was intriguing. We'll see where that, that's a, that's a newer grant, so we'll see how it goes. And would you say in your regular portfolio that it is more traditional health oriented, or do you, are you also funding non-traditional health players? In our community center prevention space, that, that stretches, I think, a little bit there because um, that, that's dealing more with the social determinants of health, kind of the upstream. Uh, if you're if you're being basically prescribed by your physician to, to be more active and to eat healthier, but you don't have access to those things, then that's a place that we're starting to right. find as well. And, and what's the, I imagine the range of your grants is pretty large. They could go from 25000 to you know, several million over, you know, four or five years. So typically... Uh, for an operating grant, might be two to three hundred thousand uh, over three years, maybe four hundred fifty thousand, somewhere in that range is kind of typical 
um, but planning grants for 25,000 and some of the larger systems work might be several million. Good, good. So I, I think to me, Kate B. Reynolds is is an example of, of a trend we're seeing in philanthropy, a very strategic grant making. I don't know if you call your program offers embedded, but they're based in community and they're all about listening and networking and forming relationships in the healthy places. Would, would tell me if I'm not right yeah, there. Yeah, we, we don't live in the, those counties, but we spend um, a good, a, a program officer going to a healthy place in the county is typically looking to spend 10 to, eight to 10 days there per month. Yeah, that's, so that's you significant. try to get to, to know the folks yeah, there. Yeah, and you get to know them. Right. Good. Well, thank you very much, Jason. All right, thank you for having it. me. I appreciate it so much. Next up, we have um, great representation. We have the health sector represented. We have workforce development pretty much by John Bell, and we have the Fed community represented by the Duke Endowment. Um, and uh, we have um, a, a Methodist minister, um, Susan, in our uh, ready class who can also help sort of fill us in on on the role of the, the Duke Endowment. Um, but I thought it was particularly important we get Duke Endowment here because it's a unique resources that we have in North Carolina and South Carolina uh, for rural communities. Um, and I, I'm sure every county has a Methodist church um, in numbers of them in rural. So um, we're glad to find out more how we can access this critical resource as soon as we get our PowerPoint on. Thank you, Misty. Thank you, Misty. Thank you, Debbie. It is a joy to be here and uh, to be able to share some about the work of the Duke Endowment in rural areas of North Carolina. The Duke Endowment was uh, formed in 1924 with the indenture of trust of James B. Duke, who is standing with a hat in front of him on uh, his vessel there uh, with many of his business associates. Uh, when he crafted the indenture, he was thinking very much about his own life experiences and what had formed him and helped him to be uh, uplifted socially in his life. He wanted the same opportunities for all people of North Carolina and South Carolina that he had had. And so when he crafted the, tr the indenture, uh, he focused very specifically on four sets of institutions that had been influential in his life that he believed could really make an impact on the people of the Carolinas. So uh, we have traditionally been very much an institutional funder rather than an issue-based uh, funder. So we strengthen lives and communities in both Carolinas um, through these institutions that are dedicated to four areas of work, uh, nurturing children, promoting health, educating minds, and enriching spirits. Uh, so these themes correspond to our four program areas, three of which do work uh, in rural areas. So I'll speak just a minute to a couple of other program areas. First, our child care program area which is really working more in the child welfare space. Mr. Duke himself was a half orphan, was his term. His mother passed away when he was a toddler. Um, his father was conscripted in the Civil War, so for a time he lived with aunts, and he knew what it was like to, to need uh, social support and the support of extended family. And so um, he wrote into the indenture of trust support for institutions that cared for uh, those neediest uh, children of society. And so today, our child care program area works mainly with six evidence-based programs and does work uh, in all areas of the state, uh, six evidence-based programs for children and trauma, as well as uh, working with the state DSS uh, systems on system change. And they also right now have a, uh, a focus on teen pregnancy prevention, and uh, the program officer for that is Tamika Williams in our child care program area. If you would be interested, if you've got any groups that are working uh, in coalitions around that topic. Promoting health. 
our healthcare program area, has a focus on small and rural hospitals and also is doing focused work in rural areas in a couple of different um, special program initiative ways right now. First of all, our ongoing um, care networks for the low-income uninsured. We have a number of networks across North Carolina. I think one of you in this class is connected uh, with one of those uh, networks. Another initiative is the Healthy People, Healthy Carolinas initiative that is just gearing up with five coalitions, uh, multi-sector coalitions, and these are in rural areas as well. Um, and these coalitions are working together around community health improvements. So for our low-income uh, uninsured network, uh, the program officer on that is our Associate Director of Healthcare, Lynn Hollowell. And for Healthy People, Healthy Carolinas, it is Mika Sales Program Officer. The Educating Minds program area is our higher education program area we fund for um, colleges and universities. And then there is us, uh, the Rural Church Program Area. And I'll get into our specifics here in a second. As you can see, uh, this is kind of the history of our total grant making at the endowment over the years since our inception. And the last numbers we have published are 2014 numbers. And so you can see sort of what um, the areas of work are and the total uh, number of dollars going out in grants from each area. We work, as Mr. Duke asked us to, to strengthen rural churches in the rural program area, in the rural church program area, specifically United Methodist congregations. Mr. Duke was a Methodist. He grew up in um, being heavily influenced by rural Methodist preachers and rural Methodist communities, and he saw uh, the rural Methodist congregations as anchor institutions in their communities, specifically in the rural places, which, by the way, he called the bone and sinew of our country, rural areas, the bone and sinew of our country. And uh, he, he famously said that if he ever amounted to anything, it was because of his daddy and the Methodist church. So he really believed the Methodist church had a power and influence uh, in the community when it was at its best and was able to impact the whole community for good. So we uh, seek to expand church engagement in communities in rural places. Everybody has a definition of rural, right? There are many. Mr. Duke gave us one, and that's our historic definition, uh, and that is towns of 1,500 in the population or fewer. In 2013, our trustees saw fit to expand our definition with one more layer of eligibility, and that is a census-based as well. Um, and so the, the historic definition is census-based, um, always according to the last federal census. So, so is our second tier definition, which is a, a RUCA code, which stands for Rural Urban Commuting Area Code. You can Google it. It'll give you a little uh, more insight. But every 10 years after every census, every United Methodist Church in the state of North Carolina goes through this filtering process. We look at the area around and see if it, uh, the area that the church is situated in fits one of these two definitions in, of rural. And if so, that church goes on our eligibility list, which is published on the website I'll show you later. And, in, and through those churches and uh, with the systems that support those churches, we hope to strengthen and challenge rural Methodist churches to improve their communities uh, in collaboration with others. So you, you'll hear some themes here that Jason uh, touched on earlier with KBR's presentation. So the scope of our grant making looks like this or looked like this in 2014. In 2015, it was 80 grants at a little over $16 million. And we work in three areas based on our understanding of what makes a strong church. Mr. Duke wanted to strengthen the church in order that the strong church might strengthen its community. Uh, that, that all might happen as, as one piece. And so we believe that three main areas uh, strengthen congregations and the communities in which they live. So we work in those and you can see that we call them rural church development, clergy leadership, and congregational outreach. So rural church development is really about building infrastructure and capacity. So some of you may know that uh, we have traditionally done a lot of capital projects with churches. We have made a shift away from that. We still do some infrastructure capital work um, 
for the purpose of supporting mission and outreach uh, and very specific to that. We really are working on building capacity, human capital in, uh, in the congregations to enhance ministry and mission. And some examples of recent grants uh, in this area of work uh, are shown here to the Rockingham District Partners in Ministry, which is a United Methodist organization of a number of uh, churches working together, a $480,000 grant every three years to support both their youth development and their home repair programs. You can see the counties that they serve. And then uh, recently, too, to the Conservation Funds Resourceful Communities Program. We're very excited about this uh, grant and the work that they will be doing in collaboration with uh, all the United Methodist Churches in 42 eastern North Carolina counties to engage those congregations in food system work. And this is actually in uh, partnership with the USDA Food Link Grant. In the clergy leadership area of work, we are seeking to strengthen uh, the quality of churches by improving the quality and effectiveness of their leadership. And a couple of examples here, another one we are excited about is a recent grant to the Institute for Emerging Issues, officially the NC State University Foundation, uh, to engage a cohort of rural Methodist pastors uh, who have actually been trained through the second grant there that's also shown to Duke Divinity School. Uh, once they graduate from that, then they go out into the world, in the, in the rural world of North Carolina, and they're pastoring, and along with their lay people there, uh, they can be engaged in this cohort of clergy and lay people who are really developing plans in collaboration with other groups in their communities to make impact in the needs of the community that, that, that have been identified by the community itself. So that second grant to Duke Divinity School is called the Thriving Rural Communities Initiative, uh, and it is an ongoing uh, long-term commitment uh, to train up rural uh, clergy leadership, uh, specifically equipped for serving in rural areas in North Carolina and engaging communities. Our congregational outreach area of work is really for congregations who have kind of got high capacity, got things going on, and already are working collaboratively with others in their community in three main areas of work, uh, literacy, food and hunger, and affordable and adequate housing. Um, and mostly in those first two areas of work, we really have a focus now on, on specifically K-3 literacy and food and hunger uh, work. So a couple, uh, three examples here. Uh, a Husky United Methodist Church. So we do make grants directly to our eligible rural churches and also to, as you've seen in the previous slides, to the systems that can support them, that can engage them, that can resource them, that can provide technical assistance. Um, and that may include specifically United Methodist systems like the annual conferences or as you can see on the third uh, bullet there, the Sound District, which is a uh, a region of the North Carolina conference. Uh, and you can ask your, your pastor colleague in the class if all of this doesn't make sense, but we also do make grants at two individual eligible churches. And you can see those three grants there, the two to the church and the one to the sound district, and, and then the ones that I've shown previously are different in, in size, they're different in scope. And the grant amounts are going and, and time frames are going to differ based on the project type, based on the scope of work and the capacity of the organization. So there's no standard grant amount that goes out. It's really what do you need from us specifically to do the work. So we do work all over North Carolina, in the rural areas specifically, and there are two links there. Uh, if you just kind of want to make a note uh, of those two, if you're interested in more information, the rural church kind of landing page, part of the endowment that gives a lot of information, and then also that second one there, if you're curious about whether your church or a church down the street that you might want to work with on a project is eligible, our, our church list is there um, and it's, it's under uh, resources, uh, the resources tab on our landing page. So when we get uh, an inquiry or an, a pre-application, I'll get to that in a minute, what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for three main things. First of all, has there been an intentional process to get to the point of this application? Have you actually seen a need? 
uh, have has the potential grantee actually enlisted others in addressing or understanding this need? Has there been a listening process of, of asking and really hearing? Has there been asset mapping and listing of assets? Has some have you have you already started to address whatever issue you think, where you are and where you can? Have you begun to take those next right steps? And then is it an appropriate time and place for the endowment uh, to step in with additional resources? We're looking at has sustainable support long term been um, thought about, been harnessed, and we give examples uh, of, of many different ways of thinking about what is sustainable support. We're a statewide funder, so we're really looking for community-based partnerships that, can, that, that will be partners long-term within the community. And then we're looking at, is there a plan for understanding what the impact of this work is going to be? And it's specifically in the rural church program area, you can see that we're looking at congregational impact measures as well as community impact measures. Mr. Duke did ask us to strengthen the church and thereby strengthen the community. So we're looking at both of those things. And we have uh, sets of metrics around different types of grants uh, for which we're looking for those things. But there is, a, is there a plan in place for measuring these things? Our application process looks like this. Um, our pre-application window is open two times a year. Currently, the Rural Church uh, Committee of the Trustees is meeting to consider applications twice a year, once in February and once in August. Our trustees determine their meeting schedules um, and their grant making schedules year by year, so that can change. And we always encourage everyone to check our website if you're interested. But right now, we're accepting applications in the spring um, and in the, uh, in the, in the fall. Um, and then about five to six months later is when the trustees make those decisions. So we get the pre-applications, and it's a nutshell version of, of what are you trying to do. We review those. Uh, as staff, and if, they, if they're in alignment with what we're looking at and you feel like there, there's a uh, potential for an application there, then we'll invite an application. Um, and there's a formal review of that that includes a site visit and or extensive telephone call if we know the area. Typically, it's a site visit. Uh, and then uh, continual review and communication through the months until the trustees then consider that project um, at their next meeting. So that's what I have. Yeah, I'm open to your questions. Sure. Uh, so a couple of questions. One is, and this is based on the limited experience I had in working um, with some Methodist churches and accessing these resources, was um, it was hard to find um, someone, the preacher was too busy, the congregation was too busy to really take the lead and have the capacity to do pre-apps and things like that. And how, what have you seen just in terms of the capacity of a church or of a broader community to, to get to this point. Right. We do, uh, as you can uh, tell from what I've said, we do kind of require the involvement of United Methodist Churches in community projects in a way that is going, that has the potential to uh, bring benefit to both the church and the community. And so I encourage people to start with the people that they know. Uh, so I was meeting yesterday in uh, the western part of the state with a, a group of congregants and a principal who was also United Methodist. And so this church school partnership that they had uh, really was about recognizing, wait, that principal is United Methodist. Maybe we can start a conversation there. Or if you're in the Ruritan Club with a United Methodist that you know, just kind of beginning the conversation of what could we potentially do together. We do say that lay people, the lay leadership of the church, particularly those who may have the time to commit to such a program, uh, are most likely the best bets for beginning this kind of mm -hmm. community collaboration because our pastors move, <laughs> and especially in the rural area uh, areas. They may only be there for a few years. They may be there for 15 or 20 years, but that is less likely than the pastor who may be moving in and out every few years. So for long-term things, we suggest trying to make those community connections of uh, finding out who might be Methodist, who might be interested in this, whose church might be able to be engaged if they're not already. 
And have you invested in building the capacity of lay leadership in addition to the clergy leadership? We, we absolutely have, and that is part of the Thriving Rural Communities Initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, it's a joint project of sort of, work, of working with seminarians and then working with church teams. We also recently made a, gra uh, a grant that we've considered very successful to um, the North Carolina Conference Academy of uh, Leadership Development, and they are bringing uh, teams of pastors and about three to five church uh, members who are committed long-term to a, a three-year process of being trained in how to engage others in their community, other organizations, um, to make uh, to make impact in their communities, and so we are funding a number of different programs for building the capacity of lay leaders as well as the clergy. That's fabulous. And and one final question. So I'm assuming that um, the the Methodist churches in North Carolina are primarily Caucasian, and so yeah. how, how does your work um, engage African Americans and and the Hispanic? Um, communities in rural? That is a wonderful question. Thank you. And um, the Sound District grant that I highlighted, or that was on the slide, I don't think I spoke about it, is actually a collaborative effort of the United Methodist District, the Sound District that's around New Bern, uh, and the, a the equivalent geographic district of the AME Zion Church, um, and we are really encouraging our clergy, our district superintendents, to reach out to their um, their colleagues and other, uh, also Methodist, uh, but historically African American denominations, to, to build those bridges and begin to work together. We also encourage um, and, and have funded collaborative efforts with uh, other denominations as well uh, that include racial diversity in, in the leadership team and in the coalition. We also fund the Hispanic House of Studies at Duke Divinity School, and part of the Hispanic House of Studies work is to empower and engage both Hispanic Latino pastors. We, we do have a growing number of Hispanic Latino pastors in the North Carolina conferences, uh, both the Western North Carolina Conference and the North Carolina Conference that cover the state. And we are trying to really empower and encourage them and help them raise up lay leadership when, within their uh, Spanish-speaking faith communities, uh, as well as empower or actually um, educate and resource traditionally uh, white congregations to reach out to more diverse communities that may have moved in. There's been a tremendous number of um, Hispanic persons who have come into many of the, the uh, rural communities in, our, in, the, in the surrounding areas of our churches. And so uh, we recently worked with the Fairway District to encourage a joint ESL-SSL uh, learning partnership uh, in the in in Moore County and that's being uh, administered or and hosted by a United Methodist faith community there. Thank you. So we're always trying to do more and do better. And reach out. Yeah so this is a ter another terrific resource that is is unique to the Carolinas. Um, so, so so think of it uh, think of the Methodist lay and clergy leaders in your community and how they can be engaged um, and there's a funding source there. Thank, Thank you. you very much. That was terrific. Thank you. Now we're going to put on more of a workforce development education hat <laughs> and get up our PowerPoint for I don't have a PowerPoint. No PowerPoint. That's Great. Thank you, Misty. Good morning. So um, I'll start just by sharing kind of a, an introduction to the endowment. Uh, so I am Cynthia Liston with the John and Balk Endowment. We are based in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, for those of you, but we do serve statewide, so we have a statewide mission. For those of you who may not be familiar with John Belk, he was a successful business and civic leader in Charlotte. Uh, he believed in the value um, of education and the fact that it was a linchpin to success. 
He and his brother Tom ran Belk Department Stores for 50 years, which is based in Charlotte. And uh, he was also mayor of Charlotte uh, in the early 70s, an um, important contributor to the city and kind of the city that it's become today. Uh, for example, he was instrumental in the creation of the new airport in Charlotte and uh, a num number of other initiatives. So we um, really are kind of, especially compared to my peers here from other foundations, we are the startup foundation on the block. Um, we, and I say that and it's a little bit more complicated. So the, sh the short history is that the endowment as a legal entity has been in existence for um, since the mid-90s. Uh, however, during John's lifetime, it was focused solely on uh, endowing a merit-based scholarship at Davidson College, which is John's alma mater. Uh, and uh, he passed away in 2007, which led to the full capitalization of the endowment. And our first executive director was hired in 2013, and most of the staff were hired in 2014. So we are less than two years in, really, to our, our current iteration. Um, so uh, we are under the leadership of John's daughter, MC, um, and our mission is um, that transforming post-secondary education uh, to meet North Carolina's evolving workforce needs is, is, is our sweet spot, and that's what we're all about. Um, so far, we, this has translated in partnership grants across the state, um, totaling almost $12 million to support community college completion and community college leadership initiatives and $10 million promoting college access in rural areas. Uh, so those have been some of the, in a nutshell, what we've done so far. Uh, we also have a third um, pillar to our work called Workforce Relevance that focuses on how do we align communities, educators, and employers so that we have a education to career continuum across the state um, that serves all individuals and again really aligns with where the workforce is going because we want to create a stronger North Carolina. Um, one thing that I will mention that we've recently done, we do see research uh, and eventually perhaps some policy work, but we do see that as, as part of our mission. So we recently partnered with uh, MDC in Durham who uh, has done a report uh, called North Carolina's Economic Imperative, Building an Infrastructure of Opportunity. Uh, I've brought some materials that uh, can be shared with the participants in this cohort uh, next week that will point you towards this report. Um, but we think it's really important because it highlights for us why we're in this space and sort of the role of education. Um, what what the, the report shares is that North Carolina does have a challenge with economic mobility. Uh, the report looked at the commuting zones across the state and found that 22 of the state's 24 commuting zones have economic mobility rates in the lowest uh, quartile nationally, um, which uh, means that those individuals who are born in the lowest income strata are much more likely and have much more difficulty moving um, into middle and upper income strata compared to other places around the country. Um, and we sort of we, we mirror that with other data that shows us uh, a recent survey by the North Carolina Department of Commerce found that 42% of employers cite lack of credentials as a difficulty in their hiring. Um, so it's those two pieces, those two fundamental pieces that we're trying to bring closer together. And what, what this report also from NBC also found is that post-secondary credentials are um, a critical component of individuals being able to move up and sort of improve their likelihood of, of um, financial security for themselves and their family. Uh, for example, 70% of the state's jobs that require an associate's degree pay a family sustaining wage for one adult and one child. Um, and you compare that to, um, I think it's more like 15% for those who only have a high school diploma. So we really sort of lay that out as the crux of why we're focusing on post-secondary. Um, and, and we divide that into several different categories. Uh, we're focused on post-secondary access, getting more individuals who have access to attend college. Uh, post-secondary uh, post completion, helping individuals who, when they do get to college, uh, finish what they start. Uh, and again, this workforce relevance piece, which is really how our community is working together to create an infrastructure of opportunity that allows many individuals to have access to career pathways that will take them to a family-sustaining job. Um, so that was a lot of information. I've got a little bit more, and then maybe we can have a conversation. So we are kind of in an interesting, you, you caught us at a little bit of an interesting time right now, and that might be why I don't have a PowerPoint, which is that we are about 
90% of the way through a strategic planning process uh, that will identify uh, our priorities, for, our funding priorities for the next three years. And so we will be sharing information with, with the state um, on where we land with all of that uh, sometime this summer. Uh, but what I can tell you is, you know, sort of where we, where, where the areas of focus that I, I think is, is what we will focus on for the next few years. Um, one of that, and I, and I kind of hit on this a little bit, but just to be um, a little more specific for this group, one is focusing specifically on high school students and making sure that they have access to college information and career advising systems. Um, another is building awareness on where family sustaining jobs are in our state and the educational pathways that will help individuals attain those jobs. Um, we are having conversations around efforts to guide post-9-11 um, veterans into uh, post-secondary education and helping ensure that they get credit for what they've accomplished uh, while in the military. Um, helping community colleges increase their uh, completion rates, uh, helping leadership. Um, there's a lot of change that's going on with that space right now, but helping um, leaders and colleges um, increase their completion rates and also helping ensure community college students who transfer to four-year institutions are successful. Uh, and again, advancing career pathways uh, by engaging employers and, and um, having conversations with educators, community leaders, and employers on what the education to career continuum looks like um, in certain places and how to build more um, kind of stronger partnerships in that area. Um, in terms of how we do our work and what we're looking for. Um, what I will say is that we see uh, a real emphasis and we have a real um, emphasis on systemic change. So we're looking for um, efforts that identify root causes to issues. Um, so less, a little bit less on kind of funding programs that serve groups of people, but rather on building systems and capacity to address the root issue, um, which you know, as a startup foundation, I think it's probably some of the hardest work that can be done, so wish us luck on that. Um, we are very data-driven, both in identifying the problem, but also having strong metrics and evaluation in place um, to, um, to understand impact, and we are willing to support that evaluation as well, um, because that, it's, it's very important to us. Um, and then the last is just that we recognize we are new to this space, uh, and so we are, are, are approaching this work with um, you know, a, a mode towards listening and humility, uh, because we want to develop partnerships. Uh, we want to be an engaged philanthropist uh, who is there with our partners for the good, the bad, the ugly, um, and to really, so that we have the opportunity to, to learn and to identify what's working, what's not working, and, and where we can go in the future. Exciting. Yeah. It, it's yeah. terrific. And to, to say Cynthia has a, a, a long history in the community college system and in the nonprofit sector in workforce development. So a great resource. So um, I assume you've done some grants. Yes. And, and talk about ones that may be most relevant to rural, some examples. Sure. So the largest grant that we've made to date is to the College Advising Corps, uh, which uh, spun out of UNC Chapel Hill and is based in Chapel Hill, but we funded them to expand uh, to 65 rural high schools uh, around the state. <coughs> college Advising Corps takes a near-peer approach to college advising, so it's a little bit like the Peace Corps or um, AmeriCorps, where it's a two-year gig for recent college graduates to go work in high schools and specifically focus on college advising. So um, they go in, they supplement the work. We know that in North Carolina there's one guidance counselor for every 375 students and they're dealing with everything from, um, you know, mental health issues with students, scheduling issues with students, and all sorts of things. And so college advising sometimes takes a back seat. Uh, so these are um, individuals who have, and most of them are first generation college students themselves, who are then hired to go back. Sometimes we've had, in some situations, they've even gone back to the same high school from where they came. Um, and they go back and work very specifically on the college going culture within the high schools, um, financial aid, and um, providing assistance, and and nudges and and, uh, and sometimes harassment to make sure that people fill out their financial aid applications. And then also really working one-on-one -on -one with students to identify um, the best college fit. Fabulous. Um, yeah. uh, a second that I'll highlight um, that's a newer grant um, is we um, partnered with Single Stop, 
which is a nonprofit that started in New York, and we have brought them to North Carolina. Right now, they're focusing specifically on community colleges, and we have four, site, four community colleges in the state that have, have just lost their, launched their single stop, stop site. Um, what it does is it really focuses on the financial stability of college students. So research tells us that the number one reason individuals who start college don't finish is because of some sort of financial barrier. And what Single Stop does is it marries um, an integrated student support um, system with technology that provides the ability for students to work with a counselor and identify resources and benefits that they're eligible for um, but may not, may not be receiving and uh, therefore can help um, augment the, the resources that they have to put towards education. So you know, the idea is that if, if these students can access benefits that they aren't receiving now, um, that they can you know, work less and focus more on college. Uh, so that has launched at three community colleges in the state, um, one of whom is rural at Nash Community College, and then James Sprout Community College in Duplin County will be coming online this fall. Uh, and they are now that the, um, what our grant did was allow them to tailor the software for North Carolina so that, um, and now that that's available, we, you know, they want to expand to additional community colleges across the state. That's fabulous. So thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. J just to very briefly sum, I think we have, um, compared to probably every state in the South and many other states, you know, sort of a wealth of philanthropic resources. We also have the C. Smith Reynolds Foundation many of you are familiar with, which is a statewide funding entity, the uh, Golden Leaf Foundation, and you met Dan Gerlach, and the North Carolina Community Foundation, which funds most with, through its affiliates, um, has a presence across the state. Um, so we have a wealth of, of philanthropic resources, not enough, you know, very competitive, but you can see that at least these three, and certainly Z Smith, I think, um, are looking for collaboration, are looking for systems focus, are looking for root causes. So even though the entry point may be through a Methodist church or through health or through workforce development or community college, it really relates 